You're listening to the Cricket Unfiltered podcast. I'm Manners. I'm with Jaleesa and Paul, and it's time to get in the cr- it's time to get into the cricket headlines. Brought to you by Piccolo Podcasts. And the first headline is my associate here is not happy about Dan Christian being left out. No, and I'm not happy with myself either because last week, just before the show went out, we had the, the squads just revealed. And I just thought, oh, they're not too bad. And it's only afterwards that it dawned on me that the, the fact that Dan Christian is not in the Australian T20 squad is an absolute travesty. Now, um, if you look at all the batsmen who were in the test side and the, and the batsmen in the, um, the T20 squad, we've got... Carey, Green, Head, Enriquez, Labashane, Smith, Warner, Finch, Maxwell, Wade, Marsh, McDermott, Phillippe, Short, Stoinis, and Turner. 16, 16 batsmen have been chosen ahead of Dan Christian. He probably wasn't even the next in line. Basically, they're almost saying that he might make a fourth Australian side. This summer in the, in the Big Bash, he's played at least two extraordinary match-winning innings. Um, he has the latest stats I looked at of all the players that were picked for the New Zealand tour. He has the second highest strike rate. So Wade, 188. Christian, 187. Turner, third on 155. Christian is averaging 36. He's right up there near the top. He's won eight T20 titles throughout his career. Last winter, what did he do? He won the um, the Vitality Blast with Knots. What did he do in that? He was the man of the match in the semi-final. He was the man of the match in the final. When the Renegades run it a few years ago, he was the man of the match. Don't tell me. He, he bowls as well. He's fit. Don't tell me that he's too old. He, If you were watching Australia and we're four for 70 after 11 overs in the T20 World Cup final, who do you want walking out to bat? You don't want uh, Mitchell Marsh walking out to bat. You don't want um, half those other guys. They're all good players. Dan Christian would give you that lovely, warm feeling. It's going to be okay. Yeah, what about if you need 40 off three overs? (laughs) Yeah. He's the man to go out and smash a few sixes. Exactly. Who else is there that can do that apart from Maxi? And how calm is he? Like, you just just think, oh, Dan's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to win because Dan is there. I mean, it's weird that his whole career, I've always just thought, yeah, good player. But I've just gradually this summer realised that I'm, you know. And and this whole notion of he's too old. Uh, He's six years younger than Tom Brady. And the whole thing of love that. Let's prepare for the future. The future is now. We've got two World Cups in the next um, um, what fifteen months or something. Uh, w- if you're not preparing for these two World Cups, what is the future for T20 international cricket? That's all it is. It is it's World Cups, and we've never won one. Um, Dan Christian is just about the first batsman I would pick, um, and I love Maxwell, I love Smith, I love the, all of them, but I want Christian in the side, and I, I, I think you know. I don't like to say match fixing, but there's something, <laughs> <laughs> there's, something, there's something extraordinary going on if he can't make the side. I fully agree with you. First of all, didn't know you had that decibel in you. Very, very, oh, you. very, very <laughs> impressed. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I fully agree with you, but there's been a problem in cricket for a while, not just at a selection level, just but just as a whole in cricket that we do age people so quickly. You go, you turn 34 and you're done. Uh, and I agree with you. I think uh, age shouldn't come into it. It's ridiculous if someone, if the 30... Eight year old is in the prime. James of Anderson's career. fifty-four and he's still <laughs> opening the bowling for England. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think if you're you know, you're thirty eight and you're at the peak of your career or you're twenty two you're at the peak of the, your career. Mm. I think you, the best people for the job, I don't believe in this ageism that we have and always have had around cricket. Absolutely, and and it's just changing. Sports science is getting better. These athletes are, are far more able to sort of be durable and play longer. Uh, you know, they work on their fitness all the time. So, oh yeah, I agree with both of you. Do you know uh, what we do a lot in cricket, which doesn't seem to happen in any other sport? We are always looking to the future. Mm. And sometimes we just need to stop and yes. and look to the now because it's like, oh, well, we can't pick him because in five years we've – well, you know, Oh, we've got, Cameron Green's coming. Yeah. How exciting. Oh, we've got, you know, oh, we've, got an Ash, we've got an Ashes series in 18 months. But, you know, like the, it is important to plan for these things, but it, sometimes there is so much forward planning that you sacrifice the now. Yep. I agree. So, uh, yeah. You're a turkey menace. Why? You're mocking there with the, the whole Pukowski and Green thing because they obviously are worthwhile players for the future. But Jaleesa's point is valid. No, but I, there is an, uh, you know, we, people do get too excited about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't mocking then? No, I was mocking You're him. You were doing both. <laughs> I, mean, I just choose to ignore him. You need to learn to do that. I, was just, I just block him out. I forget he's here. <laughs> so mean. So mean. Well, 
From Mad Man Dennett to Mad Manners. Boy, have I been triggered this week. So there has been a lot of reporting in the 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 Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, and it's been circled around Justin Langer's performance with the team. Mm. And I'll give you some quotes from Andrew Wu's article. And I think it was co-written with Chris Barrett, but I don't want to lump him in with Andrew. Uh, <laughs> the man in the mirror is almost a cliche, but if you want to be successful in life, you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror, Langer said. And this is his reply to that Andrew wrote underneath. This is as good a, a time as any for Langer to adopt his own mantra of elite honesty, but the early signs indicate more deflection than reflection. And this was in response to an article by Andrew Wu that the team was upset that Justin Langer was a bit too strict and he blew up at Marnus for ta- wanting to take a toasted sandwich onto the field after a lunch break in his pocket. And... Uh, this article seems to be based on leaks coming through player managers or similar sources. There was no actual player quoted. And then, well, what do you think of those claims about Langer being, um, you know, too strict and that coming in this article? Well, the the, the central claim seemed to be that, that there was he, – he his moods were unpredictable and there were times when um, because of that players felt um, not so comfortable and – uh, I can't criticise the journalist for writing it. I mean, if he's been getting backgrounded this information, it seems like a, a you know a legitimate article. Now, obviously, Langer- I'm not criticising him for writing it. What are you criticising? Well, I, 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 I just think it, I think it's badly written. I don't think I actually don't think it's a, an article that has much substance to it. I mean, I understand why he wrote it because it would be hard to resist that sort of a temptation if you're given that information. But if you're a journalist, don't you sit back and go, they've just lost to India, these players are tired, they've been in bubbles for six months, this is just a few players whinging to their managers, there's actually no substance to this, Langer obviously is an intense character, but what do you want to do, go back to Darren Lehman where everything's just, or, you know, have a have a bit of a sit back and relax? But sorry, in the Andrew Wu's defence, and I'm a big fan of Andrew Wu, that he is a journalist. He's yeah. there to make sure the best outcome for the Australian team or the no, players. He's there to report stories. He's there to report stories, and this happened. I just don't think this is a great this story. This is the information. Well, you can not like the story, but this is the so information. So play goes and whinges to his manager, that's a story now? If it comes out through the media, 100% that's but, but a story. But he, frames it, he have, frames it as there's a problem with Langer's coaching. But that's Andrew my doesn't problem. have a, you know, Andrew doesn't have an obligation to, to first cricket Australia or Australian cricket or Langer no, or no, anyone absolutely. to be seen in a great light. Absolutely. But he goes in with uh, Langer needs to, you know, work on his coaching and reflect on what he's he's done over the season. Uh, I think the story is there's Was a few players story? that have a whinge. No, I think it's more than that. I mean, if you read the actual story, he says... Multiple sources close to the Australian setup have told the Herald of concerns about the demands on Langer. So multiple sources could be two, could be two managers. No, but the implication there is that it's it, it, it's something uh, more substantial than that. Uh, dressing room sources say that over a gruelling summer, Langer's management style wore thin with some players who, on top of having to live in a bubble for months on end, say they have become drained by his intensity and mood swings. And I'd say... To me, that seems like a legitimate article. Of course, Langer's not going to like it, um, and maybe I don't expect Langer to like it. Maybe it's been, um, maybe it's not quite as serious as it might be made out. But it seems to me like a legitimate article. And as much as I like Langer, uh, I could see how that would be. Now, I'm not in there. I don't know what's happening, but I could see how Langer would be the kind of guy that, when he got really intense, you would be standing there at second slip, thinking, "Oh." God, I hope I don't drop a catch because I'm going to get blasted when I come back. And remember in, in the test documentary when Finch, um, was it Finch who review, didn't review um, and, and it turned out that he was out and he walked back off and Lang was absolutely fuming at him for not having um, called the DRS when, you know, these things are very, very easy in hindsight. And that, that to me seemed like a strange thing for a coach to do. I, I've always been pleased with him being in the Australian coach. I think I still am. But it doesn't sound implausible that some of these things could be true and, and valid criticisms. And... Uh, Quite frankly, when you looked at Tim Payne, that you know that whole sledging moment, then the how you know so defensive he was in that pr- first press conference, and then he reeled it right, right back to being apologetic. I actually wondered then what what kind of pressures on what kind of pressure internally is going on Payne? Well, because Payne, there's cause pressure Payne, to win the series no, against India. No, no, but what I'm saying, man, is, is Payne was taking the. Um, 
He's the a captain. Payne was taking the blame. You're not listening to what I'm saying. I am listening. Payne was taking the blame in the dressing room for setting a bad tone. But obviously, there were, I felt like there was something external that was pushing on Payne as well. Like, you, not one person. One person. I think it was the pressure to win. One person doesn't start getting edgy unless they are starting to feel not just the pressure to win. He's lost plenty of you know games. He knows how to lose. But it, it just felt like there was obviously t- tension everywhere. Well, that's because they weren't winning. That, I mean, I, I think that comes the, down that to the, they, the performance no on the field. Winning. At that point, everyone, it was no one had lost him. No, but he, he, you know, they were desperate to win that test in Sydney, and that's what got to pain because they couldn't get the wickets. But what you say about you know finding a few players, you could go into every cricket dressing room after every match or every series, and you could find a couple of players who weren't one hundred percent happy with the coach. And all they've done is done that and framed it as the reason, one of the reasons Australia didn't perform well. No, I don't think that's right at I all. I don't agree. I don't agree. I think you've taken the tone of the article wrong. W- but I, don't I, think I heard Randu Uru on the radio yesterday saying, Langer is now working through the process of reflecting on the criticism. I mean, all Langer does is reflect. I mean, every interview he talks about how he's reflecting on his own performances. I mean, this just seems to me that the players were annoyed, they were tired, they lost, and they had a whinge to their managers and it got out. And I just don't think there's much to it. I think if you're a journalist and you're given this information and you're not I'm happy for him to write it, but I can still say it's not very good. But I think that your point that every time there's been a losing series that an article like this could have been written isn't true because... Articles like this weren't written. And I don't think it's because journalists have suppressed them. I think if, if you're the journal and you get this, you're going to write it. I, I think that that indicates that maybe there is something there. And also, it doesn't mean we have to go back to Boof. There are other styles as well. You look at um, Trevor Bayless. Not that I'm saying he should be the Australian coach. But as England coach, he was renowned for being um, calm and laid back. And the players were knowing that they could go out there and express themselves in a one day and knowing that if you jump down the wicket and try to hit it for six and you hold out at long on and the side ultimately collapsed you weren't going to get a barreling because you were encouraged to express yourself and that's the way we play. We're going to win a lot more than we lose. Would the Australian players feel that way? I mean, again, harking back to the documentary, I think it was Finch where he was, um, he got his first test century and then I, I think there was one he was going to whack over long on for six and then thought, oh, better play sensibly and, um, and, and got, um, got caught at mid on. Um, so th- th- there are other styles than either Langer or, or Lehman. I, I, look, the style of coaching is... Certainly there are different styles, but I just think this is what... Anyway, this is what Langer had to say in response to the article by Andrew Rue, and this was on the Cricket Etc. podcast. Look, the only disappointing thing that is for me is that... that off so you can hear it. I'll put... Uh, we haven't really explained the toasted sandwich. Like, we sort of need to explain that in there. Justin Langer there effectively confirming that Andrew Wu's article did have some accuracy. Why? Why? Essentially, that is what he's saying. Well, he's just he's saying that well, he's, 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 saying he's not saying it didn't happen. He's saying I'm 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 annoyed that that's the way that it got filtered out. That that, that it got out through the dress, the dressing room. That's effectively him confirming that there's there's some validity to it. No, the, the validity is that he's intense. But should we explain what the, how this came about with this toasted sandwich? Yeah, what happened? Well, uh, you you explain, Menace. Well, well, Manus. 
after the lunch break, it was on the final day, the Gabba wanted to take a toasted sandwich out in his pocket. And JL said, I don't want you to take it out. It's not a good look. And I am 100% sure Manus did not care that Langer told him not to take it out. So uh, what's the big deal? I mean, I think it's a bad look. There's a... 20 cameras at the Gabba, you're trying to win a test match, and if Australia lo- doesn't win, which we didn't, the next the, the, the photo on the paper the next day is Marnus chomping on a toasty at fine leg or something. You can, uh, look, yeah, there's plenty of cameras around. If a player's hungry and they can slip a toasty in between what seemed to be overs that were taking my whole life, do it. I don't care. Well, I think it's mo- that the, the, the toasted sandwich thing is an example, but it's, it's more of the... Um, that, that's probably a trivial example. Whereas the if the, if the truth is that there are players who are feeling is that his communication style is not effective and that his mood swings are, um, are if he has mood swings and they are a problem, that seems to be a more substantial criticism. Which Langer to me seemed to implicitly to a degree not um, contradict in those quotes. Also, you've told it in a very like light-hearted way. We don't know that it wasn't a really trivial trivial issue that blew up for no reason. Do you know what I mean? That ended up a really big issue for no reason. We don't know that. Well, we don't, I've so got some sources. I've got some sources close to Marnus that seem to say that it was well, it's mountain out, out of a molehill. It's a mountain out of a molehill. So Someone in that team, they're tired, they've lost India, and they're looking for people to blame. And, you know, I'm with Justin Langer. This is a high – this is the Australian team. I mean, it's a high – it's not great cricket on a Saturday. I mean – it should be intense. It should be, um, you know, driving high standards. Langer's not there to pat them on the, the back and say, oh, good good one, mate, all no, the time. I disagree. Like, so I, when sports starts getting intense and scary and you can feel tension, I hate that. I hate it because it, but you're not. we're not saving lives. It's cricket. I know. And but The <laughs> thing is, is that people go to watch people enjoy a sport. I, I, I watch enjoy. I like watching enjoyment i don't like watching tim Payne looking tense and scared and and you know what that that kind of culture that leads to what we had in sandpaper because pre- people are under pressure and they go they're scared and they're worried and then exactly they, well then it's the players win, pointing the finger at the coach take it on the chin you weren't good enough to bowl india out had nothing to do with jl and you're probably all grumpy and upset because you've been in hubs for seven months so i, I just think it's um completely poorly framed and you know, obviously the players have had a whinge. And it, it seems like it's lo- it seems like the, the the Australian cricket team's lost a bit of its fun, and it's hard to be fun when you're losing a series against India on home soil. But I I just think like it needs to be. Oh, I think they still have a good time. I think they're a great. I think when you've got stories coming out like this through managers, that's not having a good. But time. It, I think you cannot ignore when it's come out. They've just lost at home. They're all upset, and they're all pointing the finger and, you know, all it takes is a couple of players to have a whinge to their manager and this gets out. And I, I just think it's it's a storm in a teacup. It may be, but it may not be. And I don't think we're in enough knowledge well, to, to know either way. And I think that um, it's a it was an article that if you got that background information, you're going to write it. And I think it was an article that, that needed to be written if you got that information. We've spent 20 minutes talking about it. That's, well, I, that means it was worth writing. Mate, I would write it that there's some players here having a whinge and they should pull their finger out. That's what I would say. Um, anyway, um, thank who's you. Pay, who's paying you for that? <laughs> paying me for what? To write that. No, well, nobody, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, all right, well, uh, so that was the the... The latest controversy around the Australian cricket team, the toasted sandwich fiasco, which bled into the podcast. Did anybody, like, the real journalism here was what was on the toasty? No one got to the bottom. Ham and cheese. Well, yeah, they were ham and cheese. Wasn't was as good as cheese. mine. And I don't know if you remember Nick Madsen used to do this in the Big Bash. But see, this is where I get it. Who you can have cares? a short break between innings. You've been batting. You've got to eat something. I mean, you've just had a lunch break. I mean, it is a bad look to walk out. Uh, this is no doubt about it. Come on, JL. Oh, sorry, Menace. Let's go. <laughs> Put that sandwich away. <laughs> Sir scoff a lot here. Um, all right, so let's get into the big bash. We uh, spoke to James Vincent, Carlos Brathwaite, who are playing in the final. They will either host the Brisbane Heat or the Perth Scorchers. When you're listening to this, you probably know which of those teams they're facing. But going back to the beginning of the knockout phase of the Big Bash. Well, the Heat 
Well, let me just start off by saying there's been three knockout games. I'm curious. The Heat eliminated the Strikers. The Sixers smashed the Scorchers. And the Heat then eliminated the Thunder. All three teams batting first seem to have just come out of the box very timid. None of the teams batting first seem to have taken the game on. Have you noticed that? No. (laughs) (laughs) Um. (laughs) To be brutally honest. Okay, well, the the Heat um, eliminated the Strikers after the Strikers made seven for 130 uh, in their 20 overs. 130 is not going to win you many 20 over games. Manus Labashain, the toasted sandwich fiend, took three for 13 with the ball. Because he was allowed a toasty. Well, he probably had one at <laughs> the break. Oh, you're going to run to your manager. Oh, stop being mean to Manus. Uh, I'm not being mean. Manus was completely innocent in this. He did not whinge to his manager. Um, and then... So the Sixers then smashed the Scorchers, and we just had James Vince on. He made 98 not out, chasing 168 to win. Um, but the, the big controversy in that match was Mitch Marsh was given out, caught down the leg side, and he was fined $5,000 for some an audible um, reaction to the umpire. Well, what, what do you two think? Was 5K enough? Should he have been uh, suspended for a game? Uh, I, th- I think, no, I think, uh, 5k was probably fair. If you keep, if you do it again, I think you should look at suspensions, but obviously it was a bit of an outburst and given the nature of the big bash and that you've got kids and everything like that, you can't be doing that. But I think 5k is your first warnings. All right. One of my great regrets. It is tax deductible. <laughs> One of my great regrets about my lack of cricket ability is never getting to play in a tournament where there isn't DRS. And doing the DRS sign. That's what I would do if I was Mitch Marsh. I would have reviewed it like that and made it so Austin to, yo, I want to review, I want to review. Oh, there's no review. Oh, I didn't hit it though. And um, <laughs> uh, like I just think Cricket Australia is the ones to blame. They should find themselves for not having DRS. There was, a, there was a package just after that on Foxtel where they showed all the umpiring blunders. And there was one of them where hit the batsman right in front and he didn't give it out. And I thought, oh, that is a blunder. And then it, he did give it out. It turned out there was a massive inside edge. And I hadn't seen it either on the replay. And it just reminded me, it's it's the most impossible job being an umpire where you've got technology that corrects you within a few seconds. No other sport has such brilliant technology that exposes you and that you then cannot use. So, yes, Mitchell Marsh shouldn't have reacted that way. He probably should have been suspended because, as we're, you know, the youngsters are watching it and you've got to be able to bite your tongue. But I wouldn't have been able to. I would have gone berserk and then regretted it massively. How's his arm? Is he punched anyway? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> He 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 has had a few shockers go against him in this big bash, old Mitch, and I think that was the second or third from that same umpire. So I think there was a build-up of frustration, but you, you just can't do that. As you say, punch a wall if you want in the dressing room. <laughs> Probably don't do that either. Maybe just a few deep breaths. So then we had the challenger match, and I could have these names all wrong. I'm just making them up now. But um, <laughs> the, the, the Heat then eliminated the Thunder The Eliminator, the the, Challenger. The the Challenger, the Eliminator, I don't know. But all I know is the Thunder finished third on the ladder. They looked so good throughout the tournament. Mm. And then they faced the Brisbane Heat, the battling Brisbane Heat. And the Chunder just limps to eight for 158. They never got going. And actually it was a pretty tense chase. But in the end the Heat got there pretty comfortably. Three for 162. Sammy Heaslett. Yes, the guy who played like one one day international for Australia ten years ago made seventy four not out of forty nine deliveries. Jimmy Pearson, the little keeper that keeps going, forty three not out of twenty four. So that means the Heat take on the Scorchers at Monica Oval. That game really showed um, how reliant they were on Alex Hales. When mm. he when he failed, they failed. Yep, and that's unfortunate. You have to say disappointing exit for the Thunder. They yeah, it's one and done. Disappointing for me because all season I've been quietly sort of indicating I think they're going to win and sort of sounding like I've got sort of uh, a little bit of uh, upstairs power thinking that through and then, you know. Brain power, upstairs power. You know, that's what I'm trying to think. I wanted a derby too, derby final, given it was going to be at the SCG. Mm. And then the the match between the Heat and the Scorchers has been played at Monica Oval because of the lockdown in Perth. So no home ground advantage for the Scorchers, which is a big one. And uh, I guess 
It's going to be a huge final on Saturday night at the SCG. Um, the, the ratings for the Big Bash have been very, very good. Um, this Channel 7 continue to draw strong audiences to their test and Big Bash cricket. And at the same time, they're going to court and asking for a reduction in their their rights fees and their PR departments releasing press releases saying, oh, record ratings for the cricket. So uh, I don't know if they've got much chance of winning that case now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Um, what would be great is if they could say, right, South Africa, come over here now, play a five-test match series in all the main venues, have it on free-to-air TV with nice bouncy wickets and everything else. It would rate the house down. Obviously, you'd have to push the... Um, the rugby league and AFL seasons back a couple of no months. No problem. But, but that is, I touched on it last week, it's one of the sad things about the international cricket season for for men's international cricket season now. It's it's over so quickly that I'm already, you know, I can't believe it's gone, come and gone. Mm. It'll be disappointing, I think, if it's not the Scorchers in the final because I can't... They're clearly the second best team. Quite clearly. And the Heat, I can't see them doing much against the Sixers. I almost think that would be a little bit of a dud final, but uh, prove me wrong. But... Yeah, Prove I, me I, wrong, I really hope, Chris Lynn. <laughs> I hope it's. Uh, I really hope it's the Scorchers because I also think there's now like a bit of like fire now. There's like the, you know, the Thai incident and everything. Mm. And the James Vins is now like a little bit which you don't get, undercurrent, which you don't get in the Big Bash because everyone's so damn friendly. <laughs> Actually, I was looking the other day. I, I compiled stats on every single Big Bash game ever just for my own fun. And um, betting? <laughs> no, it wasn't betting. It wasn't betting. <laughs> um, it was. Um, Actually, <laughs> actually, I'll read them out because they're actually quite interesting. Um, usually a preface to a boring please story. Read us, but anyway. Please read us your account balance and... Yes, and your <laughs> tips. And login and password. Yeah. <laughs> scrolling through 15... I'll cut this bit out. 1,500 bets. <laughs> well, this video is going live, so... <laughs> okay, so in... The history of the Big Bash in terms of regular season games. Every club has now played 99 games. Oh, I saw games. this, yep. So it's kind of almost a percentage. And the um, I've Actually, just to, before I prefer, this is a great thing you put together. Thank you. I really, when I saw this, I was like, this is very Did revealing. Did you put this together? You haven't and can you, taken I, this Can we start at the bottom, please, and work our way up? We can start at the bottom. And, and by the way, in putting this together, I was checking on Wikipedia and other things, it, it mentioned the big rivalries of the Big Bash, and one of them was Sydney and Perth. And I was like, oh, they've almost already classified it as a derby, which, you know. Well, they played a couple of finals, at least, against each other. 60-hour drive between the two cities, so it's mm. a pretty adventurous derby. But anyway, <laughs> um, so we've got 99 matches, regular season. Thunder in last place. <laughs> Hang on, what is this start for? Sorry, we so, haven't quite uh, explained. The base total wins in the Big Bash okay. since it started. So go they've on. all played 99 yes, go games, go on, go on. and it's who's won. And excluding okay. sem- excluding semis, just in the, 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 the regular, regular season. season. Okay. Thunder have won 36. <laughs> they have won one title, though. <laughs> Heat, 43. Unsurprising. One title. Renegades, 43. One title. Jump up to the Hurricanes, 49. No titles. Matty Wade. Strikers, 52. One title. Melbourne Stars, 55, zero titles. Zero titles. And then the Sixers and the Scorchers have each won 56, so just above the Stars, the Scorchers with three titles, the Sixers with two. And the dramatic pause is, what will happen after this weekend? Will the Scorchers go to four or will the Sixers go to three or will they stay three or two if the Heat win? Da, da, da. Wow. So yeah, very exciting, was, very exciting. <clears throat> That's really cool. Uh, but I think it reflects what I would think that the Scorchers and the Sixers have been the two best performed teams throughout the competition's history and the Stars as well, but just haven't been able to win finals. Yeah. My, my poor Chunder. Yeah, poor Chunder. Raiders fan and a Thunder fan. It's a hard life. Now, staying on the Big Bash, no surprises, but Michael Kling is out as Renegades, co- is out as Renegades coach. He took the job on before last season and he's now left that role to take on a job at New South Wales Cricket as head of male cricket and he'll be working with the Shield side, both Big Bash teams and the development squads. Uh, so I think that's a, a um, good thing for the Renegades to find a new coach that um, has some experience in T20 cricket coaching like uh, Cameron White, Brad Hodge, Chris Rogers, and even Trevor Bayliss could all be candidates. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll do good things in New South Wales cricket. Just, guys, be quiet. Um, all right, next one. <laughs> all right, let's have a longer point about Michael Klinger. Go, Klinger. <laughs> Congrats on the pay rise. The like, th- what am I... 
The three people in Australia who have heard of him are sitting in this room. (laughs) 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 All right, someone that people have heard of. Do not put that in. That's so. No, I'm not going to put that in. That's going to. I'm responsible for the edit this week. Oh, good. I said that. No, you have the. Yep. Swervin. You've got responsibility this week. (laughs) Swervin Mervin has been. Oh no! This was my can't let it go. Okay. Great. Someone didn't read the notes again. Uh, all right. So Murphy has been inducted to the Australian oh. Cricket Hall of Fame. Moving on. Oh, um, no. All right. Also, last headline, and it's something that I think will really tickle Paul's fancy. India are hosting England in a test series starting later this week. And I know Paul's very passionate about this. It's on free-to-air television in the UK on Channel 4. Now, would you like to do a little dance? Do you want to... It's on know, free-to-air television here. No, it's not. It's on Foxtel here. Oh, sorry, Foxtel. It's on Channel 4 in England. Sorry, my bad. (laughs) Ignore me. No, it's okay. Well, it was weird because I saw on Twitter some speculation that maybe Channel 4 will get it. I thought, that can't be right. That's too good to be true. And then I just, I haven't actually researched it. I saw your note saying that Paul will be happy. And I'm just, oh, that is, um, that's really, really nice. And I know know you're amused about how much I like it. Um, But the fact that, uh, when was the last time that an England away tour was on free t- TV in England? Um, you know, we're talking the 1990s. I mean, um, just test cricket in England on free to air wouldn't have been. They wouldn't have had any tests all summer. Would it be 2005 Ashes? That's yeah, exactly. Um, and, well, and the World Cup final. And, and, and what else? But test cricket. And, and what are they going to do? Oh, sorry, yeah. They're all in lockdown. This is perfect. They're all going to go. What's this What's strange it? sport? Where, but why? we've got nothing else to do. We can't leave the house. Why is the football shrunk so much and why is it red and why is everyone wearing... Where's the EPL? <laughs> Where, where's the EPL? <laughs> All right, so that's it. There's lots of test cricket this week. India hosting England, Pakistan hosting South Africa and Bangladesh taking on the West Indies. I'm actually not sure where that is. It is in Bangladesh? Don't worry. I think it'd be, uh, yeah, it's in Chittagong and Dhaka. Okay, great. And if that's wrong, I'll edit it out. Great. Um, (laughs) All right, we're going to take our final break of the podcast, then we'll be back with viewer mail and can't let it go. Just want to remind you to head on to Instagram or Twitter. We're at Oz Cricket Pod. That's A-U-S Cricket Pod. Also, we're on YouTube as Cricket Unfiltered. We're going to start to put up segments from the show on YouTube. So if you want to see what happens, the craziness that happens in the studio, go on to YouTube. Uh, and, uh, yeah, find us there, Cricket Unfiltered. And TikTok, Cricket Unfiltered TikTok. Yeah, go get on. on TikTok. And as I said last time, all the youngsters are giving me a hard time. I need some people over the age of 20 to back me up. Over the age of 12. All right, we'll take a quick break and then we'll be back with viewer mail. <laughs> 